is recorded. Welcome to the Global Indian Podcast, home to the greatest conversations and the official platform for people of Indian origin. Because yes, let's face it, we are everywhere. Now, you know, for our audiences out there in the digital world, every week we plunge ourselves into human experience behind our perceptions of identity, take a second look at the countries we call home, but also tackle the big conversations. This week, I'm joined by the wonderful Tim Jonas. He's going to be running me through the ideas that are reshaping the concepts of identity in Guyana. Tim, it is great to have you on the show. Thank you for joining me in the early hours in Guyana. Thank you very much for having me. It's Good. a pleasure. Tim, what's it like to be you? Because you've got this extraordinary background to yourself. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Okay. Um... I am a Guyanese by birth. Guyana is a relatively new country. We achieved independence from Britain in 1966. So we're part of the Commonwealth, but we were very much a part of that trend in the 50s and 60s of um, independence of colonies and the creation of the Commonwealth. My father is Guyanese of Afro descent and can trace his ancestry back to slavery in Guyana. So on my father's side, I am descended from African slaves brought to Guyana under the British colonial system. My mother is English and met my father back in the 60s when he went to England to study and came to Guyana to marry. So she is European, and I am um, that interesting combination of a descendant of the enslaved on one side and English on the other side. I am Guyana's population is for the most part Afro and Indo, almost equally balanced. Now, that came about because after the abolition of slavery in 1838, um, because Guyana is geographically large, there was a need for labor. And therefore an indentureship, indentureship system was developed where Indians were brought into Guyana to act as laborers in the place of the recently emancipated Africans. So that happened to such an extent in Guyana that the population by the turn of the, the, 19th, turn of the 20th century, early 1900s, um, there were actually more Indians than Africans in British Guyana. Now, at the time of independence, demographically, there were more Indo-Guyanese than Afro-Guyanese by a margin of maybe 10, 15%. I am married to an Indo-Guyanese woman whose grandmother is Amerindia. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this is if you think of the racial um, composition of my children, you get confused very quickly because in there you got indigenous Amerindian, you got Indian Indian from the subcontinent, you got African and you got European. So um, it's an interesting blend. And the reason I say all of this is that this is actually not uncommon. It's not unknown in Guyana. The, Races, for the most part, rub shoulders and get along extraordinarily well. In fact, I think we could be a model for the rest of the world. In Guyana, you have masjids very close to Hindu temples, very close to Christian churches of different denominations, and it's all fine. Um, I happily will go to a wedding or a funeral in a masjid. And my Muslim brethren will happily come to a wedding or a funeral in a church. And the same applies for the temples. I don't know why it works, but I have never seen it work on an ordinary day-to-day -day basis of social interaction as well as, as it works in Guyana. So you got an increasingly large number of mixed race folk, such as myself. Um, that does not detract from the fact that we have in my opinion, a situation which is perpetuated by the political entities, a tug of war between the two largest 
ethnic groups as to the control of the government and who has access to the country's purse strings and who has access to the avenues of power. And that is where there is an ethnic divide continuing in Ghana that needs to be resolved. And it has been the intention of various Guyanese citizens since independence to try to provide a middle ground to resolve all of that. Well, Ghana's obviously got the world's largest oil find. So this isn't just politics for politics sake. There's a large amounts of money behind this as well. And I suppose there's a big fear. It's with great power comes great responsibility from the quotes of Spider-Man, but on the other side with great with power corrupts and absolute power absolutely corrupts. And what are your biggest fears for a country like Guyana? Because if you're saying it's racially divided or ethnically divided along the lines of politics, does that have an income impact? Does that have a impact upon the way that the economic structures are put in place? It certainly does. Um, I'm going to challenge your premise. You started out saying that Guyana's come into a lot of money and I don't believe that that will um, make the political tug of war worse. The fact that a country is wealthy or poor does not affect the intensity with which the politicians fight. Um, Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, and I wouldn't like to be a politician in Haiti. It's dangerous. The, I can give other examples where whether the country is wealthy or poor does not affect the lifestyle or the power or the enjoyment of power or of the people who are in charge. So Guyana's tug of war existed before we found oil. It existed when we were a moderately well-off ex-colony back in the late 60s. It continued when we became the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere after the political system wrecked our economy. And it continues now. It will continue even though we have found oil. But all it means is that the access to the wealth, um, there's, a, there's greater wealth than you have access to, but it doesn't change the dynamics of the tug of war and you need to be a power. I don't think the size of the purse affects the intensity with which people fight for power in a government. Do, do you feel um, it, That being you, said... I was going to say, do you feel that the fact that there's so much money at stake there, you're saying that that won't have an impact, in, as, you, as you're saying, it won't have any intensity in the way that people fight with each other over this? Because the we're talking about has been there all along. Yeah. And if you had one million dollars, if if you look at Papa Doc Duvalier and his lifestyle in Haiti, which was bankrupt, he had quite a nice lifestyle. And he <laughs> held on to that goal with an intensity. So yeah. it really doesn't matter whether you're talking a hundred billion or you're talking skimming the top of the taxes in a poor right. nation. Uh, you want point, to be at the top and the fight for the top will be intense anyway. And you know, it often leads to murder and, and, you know, false accusations and prosecutions and that kind of thing. That is that is the price of the uh, candle. Now, to answer your question, if you have two large groups, especially if the groups are visually identifiable, ethnically in this case, and those are the two groups which are contesting politically, as you said before we came on this program, that means you really don't have a choice. And that's the peculiar conundrum Guyana is in, and Guyanese voterism. You see, there will always be a perception if you have an Indo party and an Afro party in, in a society that is predominantly Indo and Afro, that the party in power will be catering for its own, and that necessarily will lead to exclusion of the other side. So there is always that perception. Whether the perception is true or not, it is a perception. And the reality is the perception is for the most part true, because whether you like it or not, like choice or not, if you happen to be Indo, your family are Indo. So the end result of that will be that if you are giving out favors, it will be to people that look like you. And of course, the same will apply if you are Afro. So with the best of intentions, <clears throat> if you have an ethnically based party, the victory by that party will result in, in an unlevel playing field in terms of how the economy is managed in favor of the people that follow that ethnic party. Now, in Guyana, the, the situation is peculiar because as I said, the average Guyanese gets along 
very well with everybody else, there is no sense of innate superiority or innate inferiority that you see in other countries. There is, I would be astonished if you could find a Guyanese who would refuse, for example, to sit down and have a meal at the same table with you because he feels you're of a different caste or of a different race. That does not even exist, doesn't enter our contemplation. So the, the sense of intrinsic superiority that is so harmful elsewhere doesn't exist here. We get along well socially. The poison is introduced at the political level. Now for many years, and if you read, you will read Guyanese vote race, they wrote along racial lines. And for many years I had followed that mindset. But I now have a problem with that mindset because it impliedly criticizes the Guyanese voter. And I don't think that it's right to criticize the Guyanese voter who votes along ethnic allegiances. You see, I don't think the Guyanese voter is really voting for his own so much as voting against a racial institution. Morally speaking, we have a duty to resist a racial institution. When the mm. Nazis were doing their thing, the minority of Germans who were brave enough to fight against it and were hurt so badly fighting against it, were breaking the law, but they were doing the right thing, fighting a racist institution. Now, if you have a political party that is ethnically aligned, whether deliberately or just because the majority of its members fall within an ethnic group, it's immediately it becomes a racist organization because in its implementation of its policies, in who it favors, in the friends, in the family, there is already preference and there's already preferential treatment, whether or not it's deliberately done. And therefore, a Guyanese who recognizes that racist institution, not in his race, but in the race in the party that doesn't look like him, can't be criticized for voting against that party that doesn't look like him, that he knows will, if they're in power, be implementing policies that disadvantage the people who do look like him. And the more I think about it, the more I think that a Guyanese who votes against the party that doesn't look like it is entirely justified, he's right. And more and more what happens is that as we continue to vote race, as we continue to vote against that institution of racism that doesn't look like us, the party that is of the other color. We, we propagate, yeah. We more and more move away from merit, more and more move away from the accomplishments of the party, from their economic policies, from their real social policies. Those, those become irrelevant, they become secondary. Mm -hmm. And we have had that result in Guyana for 60 years. So we've had a gradual and sometimes not so gradual decline, descent in economics, in education, in health, in, in social affairs, in crime. We've had a deterioration, but none of it is relevant. Because well, why have you, election. as I say, why have you decided to challenge that? Because surely it'd be easy for you to say, well, I'm in my position. I'm happy. I'm comfortable. I can, if you wanted to, you could move anywhere in the world. But you're choosing to get involved in something that is inherently messy, that can be really tough. But you're doing it because you feel that a change needs to be made. But why did you decide to make a difference? Um, well, I'm not sure I've made a difference. And you're quite right that if you have a population where 40% is afro Guyanese, 40% is in indo Guyanese, if you take a position against both parties, you find yourself thrown with very, very few friends. Yeah. And most of the people are already deeply entrenched, deeply indoctrinated, and, and blindly allied to one or other of the two parties. So you're left with very few friends. It's it's a thankless job. But as you said, if you only have those two choices when it's election time and you have to put your ex on a ballot, you have no choice. I would be a damn fool if I only had to choose between my party, and I say my party, meaning the party that looks like me, and the other party that doesn't look like me. If those are my two choices, to vote for the other party. In fact, a good argument could be made 
that I am voting for a racist institution against my own interest. Now, that cannot be the intention or the end result of a fair, progressive, democratic society. And that has been recognized in Guyana from day one. One of our leaders from the 70s and 80s, Dr. Walter Rodney, who um, is acclaimed throughout Guyana and can be acclaimed throughout Guyana because he was assassinated back in the 1980s yeah. and therefore is no longer a threat to anyone. <clears throat> he opposed the then dictatorial regime, which was afro Guyanese, just like him. But he didn't go to join the indo Guyanese opposition. He started a third party. Now, I never met the man, I don't know him, but there's no doubt he was right to the point of genius and extraordinarily charismatic. But I asked myself, why did he start a third party? And I think that the reason is that he recognized that as long as there were two ethnic-based parties, there is no choice. And, they, and in the absence of a choice, issues such as social, economic, health, and the, the policies and principles which really should be important become secondary. And therefore, there's only one end result, harm. Mm. So for me, given that there was in at the, the end of our last election, which is on 2020, a couple of years before that, given that we saw that Guyana had reverted to only a two-party system again, for me, I think that there needed to be a space where the small minority in Guyana who recognized the harm of ethnic politics and the perpetuation by the two parties of ethnic politics in our political landscape, they needed to be a space for them. And the only way they could be a space for them is by the existence of a third option. Now, <clears throat> that third option was almost hopeless at the time in terms of what success it could have because the policies of the government had polarized the people to such an extent that they had retreated in to what is comfortable, which is ethnic allegiance and staying with your own. Mm. But again, that is eroded in Guyana because of our day-to-day -day social interaction where we get along well. And as you rightly so said, even young family dynamics. Well, what, yes. what, so there what, needs to be that bit. What defines a Guyanese then? Because you've got your ideas of identity saying somebody that comes from African origin, those who come from Indian origin, you have the Amerindian community, but now we're looking 60 years in, you know, what defines a Guyanese individual then? Because it has to be more well, than the object factor skin color, surely. Well, people talk about culture and they talk about culture as if it's a staid, crystallized concrete thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that it is. I think by its very definition, culture evolves daily, if not hourly. And if you were to ask me about Guyanese culture, we have our Korean or roti. It doesn't look like yours, in, fact, in my <laughs> opinion, and you forgive me for saying so, it's better. But you're, you're not being biased are, in any way, Tim. Absolutely. Also <laughs> have, <laughs> we also have our, our um, fufu and our cook-up and our okay. black pudding. And we also have our pepper pot. And it's, it's quite laughable, actually, because we'll have black pudding, but we'll use sour on it, which is an Indo concept. I eat cook up, but I like achar with my cook up. And so the things that evolve that way, you end up seeing a combination, even in the food. I'm only giving the food example. Yeah. But you won't be surprised to see someone with a sari. And you won't be surprised to see someone wearing an African outfit. It's, it's not unusual, but it also is not making a statement or, or being belligerent or aggressive. It's just what's there. And nothing's wrong with that. In fact, that's wonderful. So when you talk about Guyanese culture, you are talking about a combination and a mishmash that um, I think it's more and more difficult to try to distill the pure origin that it came from and it's preferable to embrace mix that is there now. Absolutely, absolutely. But then ultimately the identity of a nation is unfortunately nowadays depicted by the politicians in place there. The flag is narrow carried by a prime minister or president rather than the people of the nation, which I think is a bit of a sad state of affairs. But then 
when people then look at the flag of Guyana, what do you want people to be reminded of? Because it has to step away from just the political constructs. You know, that it's one person owns well, all. What I'd like to point out eh, is that it's very easy, and people do it all the time, to either deify or demonize the people in charge. But I think it's a mistake to do that. Mm. <laughs> the people who are there are very much a product of their environment. So just as I say that it is completely reasonable for an indo guyanese to vote against the Afro party or for an Afro party to vote against the Indo party, even if by doing so, they have to vote for the only other alternative, which is the party that looks for them. That also applies to the leaders because the leaders grew up in that system. Yeah. And therefore, <clears throat> there are good people on both sides. It's people who, they are racists on both sides, don't be fooled. But there are also good people on both sides who are prominent within the parties, doing the best they can, trying genuinely, if they are in power, to reach out, but failing because they represent a party that is institutionally racist, that is institutionally exclusionary and shows favor for their own. So people fool themselves and hope that they can change things from within the party. They say they'll join their party and they'll try and fix things. It doesn't work because the party intrinsically is part of the harm. That's interesting. I suppose with, with all political movements, it does take change. It does take one person to stand up, as he rightly said before, you had the gentleman Rodney, and now you have yourself that's taken the battlefield. Like, What is your biggest fear for a country like Guyana? If things don't change, if it is still a two sided debate every five years well corruption will get worse <laughs> um social unrest will get worse because there will be a wider and wider gap between rich and poor and our country has only 700 thousand people and that means that the gap will be visible you can't hide it you won't hide it behind big gated communities and separate societies it's there in your face so, so social unrest will get worse. And with more mismanagement and misspending, we will run the risk either of social unrest or that we continue along the line of poverty. And for that reason, there needs to be a system that is inclusionary so that the party and the ethnic group that has not won the government has a say in government, has a say in running the country, and doesn't feel excluded. Do you think Guyana is ready for a third party? Because I know prior to that, you had the APNU. I think you had the president there. It was David Granger, then you had the Prime Minister Moses Negamut. And the whole idea was, was here's a party, there's a middle ground where we're going to talk about liberalism, where we're going to be bringing people together, as you rightly said, it, it ultimately was the same type of sphere. And I remember I had the privilege of being in Guyana on many different occasions, on one where I got to sit down with the heads there. And you felt that it was on the cusp of change, but ultimately never happened. No. President Granger came into power under a coalition with a third party the most successful third party in our history, a third party that had won seven seats in parliament by itself. Now, you got to look at that in context. Seven seats represents something less than 4,000 votes. And in a voting population of maybe 400,000, you are still under 10%. But that is the best that the third party has ever done. It ended, it, um, what it meant was that there was a hope that the third party would restrain any excesses that the family and friends policy of an ethnic party um, accomplishes. But unfortunately, that wasn't done. I don't want to speculate why. I don't think this is the forum for it. But the APNU excesses while in office were just as bad as the PPP excesses before them. And unfortunately, the result was to polarize the population again, but also to create a serious skepticism about AFC as a third party. Yeah, 
it makes sense tim how far are you prepared to go in your pursuit towards creating a third party then because again ultimately it's it's an incredible accomplishment the fact that you're looking at this and you're doing it with reason and logic and you're saying it i think in a very humanitarian viewpoint saying a country deserves an opportunity to grow that every Asian society grows together that there's no divides because ultimately we're all the same people we're all the same ethnicities we're all the same we're all the same species in the back of the planet but for you your overarching vision how far are you willing to go in your own life to do this knowing the sacrifices that have to be made for any politician entering into these spheres I, I feel, like I'm, I, I feel like I'm you. making you a messiah right now, Tim. <laughs> it feels that way quite strange. Well, well, I laughed when you asked the question because I, I, I sensed that this was the time for me to give you a rousing speech about, you know, victory <laughs> or death. But the true, the true answer to your question is that I simply don't know. Um, if I've got the energy and if I've got the wherewithal, I will try my best. Um, I, I believe a human being has an obligation to try his best because there are so many unknowns. The existence of God is an unknown. So you try your best, you do the best you can. And if you see light at the end of the tunnel, good. If not, at some point, you have to give it up. But I can't answer your question as to how far you go. You do the best you can on a day-to-day -day basis. Tim, I, I can see that you're struggling with a the cough there. So I don't, I don't want to have you on for any, any longer than you need to be. But it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I think it's really interesting just having a look at the dynamics of politics because... When we look at it globally right now, it is polarizing. We're seeing the situation in the UK right now, inwardly, with the Conservative Party. And again, the UK, as much as we say we've got three parties, it is a two-party system. We've seen, obviously, situations in the US. But the fact that you're throwing your hat in the ring should throw light to many other individuals out there in the countries that they call home to say, we have to do what is right for the country as a whole to progress and not just for a particular community because ultimately you know, skin color is just an arbitrary factor to our humanness it cannot be a personal brand it cannot be the only defining sector i think a great example of that is even your own family system you said that you have those people who are voting on skin color i'd hazard to say like how how african african do you have to be to vote on one side and how asian indian do you have to be to vote on the other because after a while, you're going to have more people like your children. You know, what are their choices? Is this ultimately an opportunity for people like your kids to have a third party that says, we represent your interests too then? Well, if any of your listeners was disappointed that they didn't get a rousing speech from me, they certainly got one from you. Congratulations. <laughs> you would make a very good politician, Rajab. Um, to answer your question, I think that is where Guyana is evolving, and that is our future. You see, I, I gave you the example that um, at independence, the demographics showed that there were more Indo-Guyanese than Afro-Guyanese, but that has actually been eroded, and now they're pretty well balanced. There still is a slight demographic advantage um, to the Indo faction, but they are much more closely balanced. And in fact, the People's Progressive Party lost the 2015 election by only about six, 7,000 votes, only one seat. Wow. And the next election in 2020, they won, but again, by only one seat. One seat represents about 6,000 votes. So it's razor thin. And the reason for that shift is the increase in mixed race. That's so very interesting. The, it, well, I'll tell you, even as of 1992, 1997, the division was much starker. They, they, their victory was by a much more comfortable margin. And I rather suspect they are looking down the road and they are seeing that the demographic is changing and that that lovely cushion that they have of a solid demographic advantage is becoming very thin. I think you'd mentioned oil money and I think that the intention, the hope is to use access to the oil money to build roads and build bridges and build this and build that. On each occasion, um, demonstrating to Guyanese what a wonderful government they have. Unfortunately, as you know, free money, which is what our oil money is, we haven't done anything to earn it. It's just money that lands in our account. The expenditure of free, free money is not to be equated to sound fiscal responsibility and prudent management. And we are not seeing those latitude.
So the loyalists will always be loyal, but it doesn't, it's not going to work. It needs, we need a better informed, competent and transparent management of what we have. And until we have that, I'm afraid that we'll continue to be in a book. Fantastic, Tim. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you in the show. Thank you for coming on. I know that you're, you, you've struggled throughout there, but I really appreciate your, your time, your effort and your energy. And hopefully you'll be another guest on another occasion as well. It was a pleasure. Happy to do so. Good. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Roger.